So, that, so the title of my talk is Exploration, Visualization, and Analysis with JUMP. And we really emphasize the exploration and visualization. So how many of you have heard of JUMP? Anybody? Rusty's used it. We've used it. Uh, JUMP is called uh, Statistical Discovery Software. And you see a couple of our pictures off to the side. Uh, it works on Mac and Windows. Uh, it has a very nice uh, graphical user interface. It's point and click, drag and drop. Very colorful, very dynamic, very interactive. Great support files um, and help files available. Interacts with other software like SAS and R. And we're actually part of SAS. How many of you have heard of SAS? Right, so, so SAS is in many schools, many businesses. A uh, little bit of history about SAS. SAS started in 1976 out of some agricultural research at uh, NC State. And one of the co-founders of SAS, his name was John Saul. And John, how many of you remember the Macintosh, the first Macintosh computer that came out? Well, he was fascinated with this. And I'm on the development list at SAS, and I get emails at 3 o'clock in the morning from John doing development work. So I'm, back in the 80s, that's the way he was as well. So he thought it would be really, really nice to have a point-and-click interface to run on this Macintosh computer. So he started to develop desktop software. And rumor has it that the internal memos that went around called it John's Macintosh program. So Jump was designed on a Mac. It's always been point and click. It's always been dynamic. There is a programming language behind the scenes, uh, but you don't have to program. Uh, it's very flexible. Um, SAS as a whole is used in many of the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, it's used in many schools. A lot of schools have campus-wide licenses. Uh, Jump is smaller. So SAS has around 11,000 employees. Jump has about 150. Um, and we focus on getting statistical tools in the hands of users. And our key point is getting to decisions faster. Use pictures, use graphs, interact with your data so you can draw conclusions from your data much more quickly and much more effectively. And also so you can communicate your findings with others. So I lost my, there it goes, there. Um, so Allison called me after um, coming to speak at, at, at Wofford. And, uh, and uh, did I say it right? Wofford. Uh, and, um, you know, I was delighted for the invitation. And, of course, my first question was, what the heck is squab? So my background is industry, teaching statistics in industry, teaching in manufacturing, teaching introductory statistics uh, at a university. My undergraduate degree is in psychology, uh, but that was around 25, 30 years ago. So I'd never heard of squab. So I so went online and did a little search uh, and found this little quote. Committed to simplifying the transition to quantitative analyses for students as well as advanced, advanced researchers. So JUMP really does fit nicely here. Our whole role is to make data analysis easier. Put the tools you need right at your fingertips. So I needed to think a little bit about what you actually do and what's important to you um, to try to get my hands around the language. And you have a, a nice website with a lot of uh, nice, nice tutorials. 
Um, so, I, so I watched some of the tutorials. And my favorite was the last one I have listed here, hypothesis testing curse or abomination. And hopefully that's not the main thought. Um, and what we try to do with Jump is try to make hypothesis testing easy. It's in integrated right into the software. So I'm going to jump right into the software. Uh, and the rest of this um, demo, for the most part, is going to be right in the software so you can see what Jump does. Uh, and the key point is that whether it's Jump or another package, there are a lot of really nice statistical packages available that allow you to interact with your data, uh, that take some of, the, some of the effort out for uh, hand computation. Uh, you don't have to know the underlying formulas. You don't have to use lookup tables. Um, and you can show some results very effectively using nice graphics from a variety of these different packages. Okay. So what can Jump do? Um, we can work with data from a variety of different sources, so we can directly read in uh, Excel data, SPSS data, text files. Uh, we can connect to databases. Um, we can uh, connect through ports, uh, RS-232 ports, to directly um, capture feeds from equipment. All of our graphics are dynamic interactive, so you can circle points and highlight points and subset dynamically and resize dynamically. Hypothesis testing and confidence intervals, so all of the inferential methods are built right in. Um, so all of our platforms you'll see start with a picture. We always have a picture of our data that makes sense based on the type of data that we're dealing with. And they allow you to unfold and ask for additional information as you're going along. So if you don't need to do a hypothesis test, you don't need to ask for it. Confidence intervals in a lot of cases are produced automatically. Distribution fitting and transformations, so a lot of capabilities for trying to understand the underlying distributional fit of your data. Uh, and we provide all the supporting statistics. Uh, we have a, a, a formula editor that allows you to do all sorts of complex transformations. And we also have a, um, a nonlinear model to allow you to specify your own particular model. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you do much with multivariate analysis and education research. There's a lot of emphasis on factor analysis and structural equation models principal components analysis, modeling, simulation, DOE, design experiments, integration with other packages. Um, and this last bullet um, I find particularly interesting. We've done more and more over the last few years to try to make jump so it's extendable. Um, so if you're doing work and you've created a graph and you'd like to be able to recreate this graph with this certain look and feel every single time, you can save the code. And then you can regenerate that code every time. Um, you can also create custom code so that others can run the same code on their data and get, this, get similar results. So Jump is extendable. It does have this language that goes behind the scenes, but it's not something you need to know. It's, it's very transparent. Okay. And let's just get right into Jump. I lost a slide there somewhere. So I've got a lot of slides. I'm going to minimize some of these guys. I'm doing this on a Mac, uh, but I'm running uh, parallel, so I'm actually looking at Windows. How many of you are on a Mac? Okay, so the look and feel is going to be very similar. Uh, we have a home window. And the home window lets you organize your data sets that you have open uh, and see what you've opened before. So on this side, I've got a few data sets that are open. Um, and there's a nice little data set that I like to play with called SAT. So we've all taken SAT tests at some point. All students have taken it at some point, or ACT. They've taken something, right? So I'm going to start with some generic data and then get into some data that might be a little bit more relevant to the work that you're doing. Okay. Our data is structured around data tables, so we have columns and rows. On the side, we have some panels that tell us a little bit about our data. So where it says columns tells us the number of columns we have, and the little icon tells us the type of data that we're dealing with. And this is one of the most important facets in Jump. If you see a little red bar, it says we've got categorical data, data or labels. If you see the little blue triangle, it says that we've got continuous data, or numbers. So we might want to calculate a mean, for example. All of our analyses are under the Analyze platform. And the way we structure them is really based on the way our, our data table is structured. So John Saul was not a statistician. He actually, um, I think his undergraduate degree was political science. And he was working on his graduate degree in statistics when he, when he left it to uh, start SAS. And when he started Jump, he thought, well, if I were a practitioner, rather than following a textbook, what would be important to me? Uh, so the way the platforms are structured, distribution, I'd like to look at one variable, just one column of data. And it doesn't matter if it's labels or if it's ordinal data, so a one to five scale, if it's text, if it's continuous, it doesn't matter. Um, and I can look at multi -variables, multiple variables at a time. So distribution 
will produce graphs and any univariate statistic that might make sense. Fit y by x produces any bivariate graph. So think of simple linear regression, two sample t test. Do you, do you use some of these methods? Two sample t test, ANOVA, logistic regression, chi square. And then if you want to build a model, we have the fit model platform. So this is generalized linear regression. So multiple regression, logistic regression, generalized linear models. Um, and again, it's very, very flexible. Um, and all you need to know is the right platform to go to. Uh, we do have a, a variety of other more complicated and complex um, platforms. Um, so we have a very rich nonlinear library for nonlinear models, multivariate methods. And I'm going to talk a little bit about reliability and survival. Essentially, these platforms are used um, if you've got data that's skewed and you want to assess the distributional fit and then make predictions from that distribution that you fit. If you're interested in pure graphs, we use the graph menu. And these, again, are very, very flexible, dynamic graphs, and we'll see a few of these as we go along. Um, so let's get started with just distribution. Distribution, I want to look at one column at a time. So this data is SAT scores over an eight-year period for all of the states. Uh, and we have information on populations, on um, what we're paying uh, in terms of uh, education, student-faculty ratio. It's slightly dated, but it's still interesting data. So I, I might be interested in looking at verbal scores, math scores, and maybe breaking the data down by region. So I can select multiple variables at a time, hit OK. And what Jump does is it gives me graphs, and it, it makes a decision on what type of graph is appropriate based on my data. So SAT scores is continuous data, it's numbers. So a histogram makes sense, a box plot makes sense, and then some basic summary statistics. And you can tell Jump if there's certain statistics you'd like to see, you can turn them on and off. For nominal data, like region, it gives us a bar chart and a frequency distribution. Now the key with all of our windows is that everything is dynamic. So if I'd like to change the size of this graph, I can resize it. If I'd like to explore the distribution of regions, so for example, if I click on the south region, right, I've selected all of the observations corresponding to the south, and I can see how those observations are distributed for math scores and verbal scores. And those observations are also highlighted out in the data table. Now, all of our windows, we try to keep things clean, and sometimes it's hard to find things. Everything is hidden under the red triangle. So if I click on the red triangle, I'll see options that are appropriate for that type of data. So I don't have to go to some other platform if I want to do a hypothesis test or if I want to compute a confidence interval. By default, I see a 95% confidence interval. Oops. 95% confidence interval for the mean. That shows up by default. But I can also ask for a CDF plot or a one sample t test. And as I move my mouse over these options, Jump's telling us what the options would provide. It's telling, telling us what they do. So if I were interested in doing a one sample t test, let's just pretend that this is not bimodal data, that it's nice, nice and symmetric. If I plug in a value, and I'll plug in a value kind of outside the boundary of my confidence interval, so five, maybe 535, I've just added a test. So Jump is doing a one sample t-test. It's got three p-values. So the first one is for the two-tailed test. And anywhere where you're doing inferential statistics in Jump, we try to give you a picture to help understand what the p-value is telling you. P-values are difficult to understand. Um, so in this case, what we've got is a graph and the center of this graph is our hypothesized value. And what we're seeing is the distribution of all sample means we'd get if the null hypothesis were true. We got a value out here in the tail. So it's a nice visual to tell us how far apart they are. Now built right into jump under the red triangle is a couple of animators. If I'd like to develop a better understanding, if I'm teaching or a student just trying to get my hands around what this p-value is telling me, the p-value animator lets us play with that distribution and the hypothesized value. So if I click and drag the hypothesized value and decrease the distance between what I observed and what I'm hypothesizing, I can see what happens to the p-value. The further away I am, right? and what Jump is basically telling us is, you know, it's very unlikely you're going to get a sample mean where this line is if the hypothesized value is where this curve is centered. So it makes it a lot easier to try to understand what these p-values are telling you. 
So you'll see that kind of help throughout JUMP. We also have, um, in this platform, distributional fitting. So if I'd like to assess the fit of the data, and I have some idea that maybe it's log normal or something else, I can select that distribution and JUMP will fit it for us. Or if I'm lazy or have no idea, I can just select all. Okay. And what JUMP is going to do is it's going to fit all of the continuous distributions in the library and pick the distribution that makes the most sense, that explains most of the variation. And in this case, what do you think? Did it do a good job? It says normal mixture two. Does that look like a normal mixture two? It's actually fit two normal distributions on top of the data, and then it's estimated the parameters for those two unique normal distributions. Okay. And I can do some additional work here. So if I want a diagnostic plot, does it look like it actually did a pretty good job? So think of this as a normal quantile plot applied to a normal mixture. Does it look like it did a good job? If the, if the points are straightened out, then the distribution I've selected makes sense for the data. So this is distribution. Now, a nice starting point um, when you're working with data, how many of you know immediately what you need to do with, do with your data? Is it easy to tell what you need to do? It, it can be a challenge. So our first option under graph is called Graph Builder. And Graph Builder is a new tool that allows you to explore your data. So I might be interested in those same three variables. And I'm going to drag and drop, and Jump's going to make some decisions for us on what type of graph might make sense. So the two dominant variables are continuous, math, and verbal. And it's used as an overlay variable, region. If I click and drag region, I can wrap it around. Or I can set up a number of different views of the data. So I'm going to leave up this view here. And does this tell us a story? Does this communicate anything to us? What do, what do you all see? Any interesting patterns? How about down here in the south that I already had selected? You see anything interesting down here? It looks like there's two separate populations there, right? Uh, I live in Maine, right? So here's Maine. How are we doing? <laughs> so Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont are all up here. So we're very tight, but we're very low. So our scores aren't so, aren't so great. Right? So we can see a lot in, in the data. Now we have other pictures of the data. If I start over here and Perhaps I would like to see region as an X, and I'd like to break the data down by math. Then I get a scatter plot. And any, any of these graphs, I can right click and change it to something else that might make more sense for the data. So I might be interested in box plots. Okay. So this gives me another picture. And does it look like there are some serious differences between the regions? Yeah, there's some, some, some big differences. But what I like about this platform is it's very forgiving. So if you mess up, you just hit start over, and it gives you a clean slate. And we've added some functionality. This may or may not be of interest to you, but um, geographic uh, mapping is now available. So if I click on state and drop state where it says shape, now I've got a map. And if I'd like to look at the distribution of, say, verbal scores by state, I simply drop it on top. So does this make sense? So red means high scores on average, blue means low. Does that seem reasonable? So in, in Iowa, are people just smarter than everywhere else? What do you all think? How about in, uh, I think that's North Dakota? The people in North Dakota and Iowa are wicked smart. Is that right? Wicked smart, that's what they say in Maine. Wicked smart. Does that make sense? Or do you think there might be something else going on? What's that? Any ideas? Time zone? So they're only taking it if they're trying to leave the state. Do you think Iowa is the same? So maybe they're just really smart. All they do is milk cows and study. Maybe. 
All right. Well, we have other variables here, so let's, uh, let's explore some other variables. How about this one right here, percent of students in the state that take the exam? Does that seem to explain part of what we're seeing? So in this case, the blue means a very small percentage of students are taking the exam. And you said Alabama. They only take it if they want to leave. They want to get out. So Alabama is that one, right? So very few students in the state actually take the exam. Right. So we're using graphical tools. We're, we're doing statistics, but we're doing graphical tools to explore data and tell a story. In, in the quality field, there's an expression that data are the, is the voice of our process. And the challenge is to understand what the data are telling us. What's it, what's it trying to communicate to us? So this is a graph builder. Uh, and we have several other graphical tools available uh, that are nice for communicating information. Um, this one's called the bubble plot. And how many of you have seen uh, Hans Rosling has a uh, video? Right, so this is, our, this is our version of that. So Hans's version was looking at, what's he looking at, uh, population sizes and healthcare populations and changes over time and how the third world, world countries are catching up to. So this is our version. Um, and if I hit go, let me, actually let me click on the plain states and let me trail the lines. And if I hit go, I can see where scores are changing over time. I'm going to hit stop and here's the south and I'm going to hit split. And what do you see happen? So we've really got two clusters. Now we've sized these points by the number of the students in the state that are taking the exam. So what kind of pattern do you see? Plain states, teeny tiny little dot says very few students are taking the exam. And when you get to the northeast and New England and Pacific in the south, quite a few more students are taking the exam. Okay. So a nice graphical tool for communicating results. Now if we go back to formal analysis, if I'd like to look at one variable against another, I use fit y by x. And this is a platform that tries to take some of the guesswork out of what the correct analysis method is. Is this a two-sample t-test, or is it ANOVA, is it a pooled test, is it, do I have equal variances, or, you know, what, there's a lot of decisions to make there. Jump tries to, to make some of those decisions for you. So if I'm interested, for example, in comparing region in terms of math scores, I've got a continuous variable against a nominal, and by default, Jump is going to do a one-way ANOVA for us. If I want to plot math scores against verbal scores, Jump is going to allow us to do simple linear regression. And all of the options are going to be under the red triangle. So in this case, where I've got a continuous against a continuous, my options are things like fit line, a fit polynomial, or fit a special, including all sorts of different transformations I might be interested in. If I fit a line, Jump gives us the formula for the line, and then it gives us the ability to ask for other information that's really important, like a plot of our residuals to see if there's anything funny going on. In this case, I've got a nominal versus a continuous, so I might want to look at box plots, or I might want to do ANOVA, um, a nice simple method for comparing means uh, that's becoming popular is analysis of means, ANOM. Um, so we can ask for one of these, and again, Jump gives us pictures to help us understand uh, what's going on. So my, my p-value here was 0 0.0001, right? And if we have a hard time remembering what p-values are, these guys are confidence intervals. And if all the confidence intervals don't overlap, then we know that there are some differences. And it gives us an indication of which means are probably different from the other. Um, so that's, um, that's simple linear regression and ANOVA. And I think I'll go to a more interesting data set for, um, to talk about regression. Let me see. I'll go to this one. Some car data. If I'm interested in doing regression, this is some data where I've got um, the horsepower of a car and the engine size, and I might want to see how these other factors are related. Um, regression is, is simply a matter of plugging in variables, so I'm going to use horsepower as my response, and then select the variables I'm interested in. So there's no need to dummy code. Jump's going to parameterize things correctly for us. If I think that there's an interaction or a differential effect, um, I can specify that. So for example, displacement in country, there might be an interaction. I'm going to put that in there. And when I hit run, 
Jump always gives us a picture that tries to tell us how, how good our model is. And the tighter those points are to the li line, the less unexplained variation we have. And we're trying to explain as much of that variation as possible. Here's our R square. And I'd probably be more interested in R square adjusted. And it gives us our model and some information down below. And one of the nicest features I like here is that you can visualize your model. If you're, not, if you're not comfortable with the statistics and you really would like to explore what if scenarios, you can ask for a profiler. So the profiler is taking the coefficients in our model. And in fact, we can look at the p-values. Which of the terms in our model are most significant? Meaning the lowest p-value. Anywhere where you see an asterisk. So does it look like we have an interaction? And jump denotes the interaction with a little asterisk in between. Does that look like it's significant? That looks highly significant. How about country? This is a case where low is good, right? So if we see really low p-values, it means we've got something that's explaining variation in our response. So what this graph below is telling us is on the side, it's giving us what our average predictor horsepower is and a margin of error. And as I click and drag and change the value of one of the x's, I can see how the predicted response is changing. So it allows me to interact with my model. I love this for teaching. I love it for communicating what my model is telling me. I love it for allowing other people to, to, um, to do what if scenarios. But what if we had this combination of events? Um, in fact, for interactions, sometimes it's difficult to explain what an interaction is. We have a very significant two-way interaction, and it's between country and displacement. So what happens to the slope of country as I change the value of displacement? What happens to that slope? As I get to the higher levels, is there a differential effect? And we can see that, and I'm going to just adjust the axis here, at the higher levels, so the larger engines, we're not getting as much bang for the buck in terms of horsepower right, as the other countries are. So very nice for communicating. And if you're interested in doing simulations, there's a built-in Monte Carlo simulator. So that, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of jump. And now I'm going to, um, to do something that's probably a little risky for me. Since I don't fully understand your language, I'm going to try to use some data that, you, that might be relevant to you in the work that you're doing. So, I went to a website and found, found this data set. This is from the ASU. This is your data, right? Um, and so we're looking at response times um, and bins. And the data is sorted by response time. Um, and some hand a lot of hand calculations here, right? So we've calculated the decile. We've calculated, I think this is the cumulative distribution. So we've calculated a lot of columns here to allow us to produce graphs. When you install Jump, notice, notice that there's a little button here at the top. If you're on a Windows machine, an add-in for Excel automatically installs. And what this add-in allows you to do is push data over to Jump, push data over and immediately open up the Graph Builder or one of the other graphing tools. Right? So I've already done this. I've just pushed over the first three columns. And I'm calling it rat data. And I'm just going to delete this one column. And I deleted deciles because we really don't need that. We just need the, the raw data. So some of the graphs that were produced, there was a rel relative frequency graph. There was a CDF plot. Um, so let's see how we would get these graphs. So I've just got raw data, 1,500 observations, give or take. And I'm going to go to distribution. And I'm going to graph these two. So here's the distribution of response times. Here's the mean. So by default, it gives us some summary statistics. And we see a frequency distribution for bin. Now, we might not be interested in all of these higher values. So what do we do with these? In the spreadsheet, it looks like you just sort of consolidated them into this bin here. OK. OK. OK, what the pair? OK. So, so if I want to do something like that here, um, let's say I'm going to go back to the data. And beyond bin, 
I think, 11, um, there really wasn't much action. There wasn't much going on. So an easy way to handle this is to simply recode the data. I could use a, a formula. So in jump, we have our own formula editor. So if I double click, I can add a new column, and I'll just ask for a formula. So I could create a formula here to do exactly what you did. Or I could be kind of lazy and recode. So I'm going to go column, recode. And we might put all of these where the frequency is really re relatively low into one bin. Maybe call it 99 or something like that. Okay. And jump allows us to, to, to um, either override the data that we have, which I think is never a good idea, um, or to copy the data into a new column, or to save a formula capturing the changes that we just made. Like, let me ask you a question. How, how, much, how many times do you get data and the data is nice and clean? It's perfectly formatted, especially if somebody's able to type things freely. There's always problems. So this recode allows you to clean up the data and put it in a workable format. I like to use this formula column uh, because it lets me see the logic for fixing the data. If this is something that you do repeat, repeatedly, you do this over and over and over again, you can also save the script. And this is just a little bit of code that allows you to apply it to any data set. So I'm going to create a formula column and hit OK. So now I'm going to delete this column that I didn't do anything with. Okay. And if I take a look at bin 2, look at all the variables again. Bin 2 should look pretty much like what's in your spreadsheet. So by default, it's giving us uh, proportions and counts. Okay. And again, everything is linked together. So if I want to see how things are distributed, I click on a bar, and it shows the distribution across the others. If I'm interested in exploring the underlying distribution for this data, again, I can do it here under continuous fit. In fact, what kind of distribution makes sense for this? I think you tend to use the log normal or displaced exponential. Okay. Okay. So of the distributions we have here, and we have another platform with additional distributions, I can explore these different possible distributions that might make sense. And let's see what jump says. Jump is saying to be able to fit that, we need some sort of transformation. Um, so one of, the, one of the canned distributions really doesn't make sense for this data. Now another platform that's more robust for fitting uh, skewed distributions is reliability, life distribution. And this is really intended for skewed distributions where we're looking at things like time to an event. Uh, it recognizes if you've got censoring, so if you've had dropouts, um, and also gives you some control over the types of estimations that are being done. Okay. So we get this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve. And in fact, I think this curve looks exactly like this curve here. Should, hopefully. Okay. And this platform allows you to visually explore different possible distributions. Okay. So as I'm clicking on this, I'm adjusting the scale, so the scale is changing to whatever I've selected. So it allows me to visually make some comparisons of the different distributions. Okay. If I keep it here and explore the different distributions, then what it's doing is it's throwing the curve right on top of the data. Okay. So how well does log normal fit the data? It seems to not fit very well up there in the, the corner. Does Weibull do any better? And it's kind of hard to tell. And this is also a platform where you can ask Jump to do some of the work for you. So I want to fit all non-negative distributions. And Jump's going to go through. Did I get it? There it goes. Jump's going to go through, and it's going to compare all of the distributions in the library and use this AIC and also BIC, which is the Bayesian Information Criterion, to try to tell us which distribution makes the most sense for the data. Okay, so this one, in this case, it picked the, the, the log logistic. Now, some of the capabilities we have in this platform, um, we, we have profilers that allow you to explore um, percentiles of that distribution at given response times. 
And for the fitted distributions, you can also explore um, the hazard function uh, and the density function, okay, all by drag and drop. Now, another little example, um, and this came from some conversation with Bill um, on uh, an experiment. And I sort of simulated some data just, to, just for illustration. So this is an experiment where we are looking at a number of birds um, over 11 bins. Uh, we've got either fixed or variable um, interval schedule. And the schedule is 5 seconds, 10 seconds, or 20 seconds. Does that kind of scenario make sense a little bit? Would it be reasonable? Okay. So, um, so in, in an engineering sense, we would call this a 2 by 3 factorial experiment. Right, that's repeated over the 11 bins. Okay. So how would we explore this data? And actually, I've saved a few scripts over here. And just so you can see what the code looks like, I generated some distributions. And I wanted to be able to cre recreate those exactly as they were at a later point in time. Um, and this scripting language really makes that possible. So. I think all I did was ask for the variables that I have displayed there. So I've got birds. I've got 11 um, bins per bird. Does that make sense? I like this for, uh, for checking my data to make sure that I don't have any data quality issues or any repeats that I shouldn't have. So nothing interesting there. Here are my bins. And I can click on the bins and see that they're kind of dis distributed evenly between the two variables. That's not very interesting. But I might be interested in exploring for the fixed schedule my response times versus variable. And does the distribution seem to change? So as I go, and this is simulated data, so this is probably doesn't re reflect reality in any way. Um, does the distribution below seem to change? For the fixed schedule, we have more of the lower values. For the variable, they tend to be a little bit higher. How about for the 5 versus the 10 versus the 20 second schedule? Seems like there might be some differences there. Okay. Graph build is a great place to explore this further. So I might look at um, bin number across the bottom and response rate. Okay. And it's fitting a, a spline. So, so lambda equals 0.05, a smooth curve. Okay. And I might want to break this down by the variables I'm interested in. So I might be interested in interval. I've got a couple of drop zones, an X drop zone and a Y drop zone. And I generally move things around until I get something that tells me a story. So here is interval. The red is variable. The blue is fixed. So what do you see? So for every bin, the variable schedule is getting a higher response time. If I hit undo and check out schedule, I'll do it as an overlay. What do you see there? So in the lower bins, pretty much pretty similar. Uh, the 10 second interval is flat all the way until you get to maybe bin 8 or 9, and it starts to peak up. Um, the 5 second starts to peak up around 6, so it starts to peak a little earlier. And if I wanted to see both of these combined, does that tell us something? So are the, are the patterns similar or are they different? So this is the fixed interval, and this is the variable. Look at the blue line in this one versus this one. All right, so it looks like there's some sort of interaction possibly going on here. Okay. So this is just graph, graphical exploration. And I really like to use this to help me understand what type of analysis might be appropriate. What makes sense? I don't need to start right with a t-test or an ANOVA. I'd like to start with the graphics. And one of the key reasons for starting with the graphics is it tells you if you've done something funny with the data, if you've got your data structured weird, you've got some strange observations that need to be fixed, or you've got some data quality issues. Now, if I wanted to summarize this data, how many of you use pivot tables? Pivot tables. Anybody use pivot tables to summarize data? So we have pivot tables built in. Um, I'll show you what the bubble plot would look like for this data. So I've put bin as the time variable, and I'm going to select all of my data. I'm going to go to Edit and Select All. And I want to see what's going on over time. 
I've got it grouped by the schedule. And by the time I get to 11, you, you can really see what's going on. So let me stop this. And you can also drag it around manually. So when I get out here, I might want to break one of these guys out. So here's the five second interval. And I'm going to split that out. And you can really see the difference at, at the five second interval between the fixed and the variable schedule. Okay. So this is nice for communicating results. So rather than looking at static plots, and by the way, this is a platform. The distribution, you can do this. And there's a couple other platforms. You can save this as a flash file. So if you're communicating results to somebody who doesn't have jump, and you'd like them to play around and see how the lines are crossing, um, they can do the same work. That what if scenario, um, I, I really like the ability to interact like that. Now, we could do a more formal analysis. And in this case, it's probably a MANOVA, or repeated measure type of experiment. Is that appropriate? Um, we have a lot of tables functions that allow us to concatenate data, join data tables together, split, stack. Um, so I've already split this data table out in a script. And MANOVA is run from the same exact place um, as multiple regression. So these are the response times in the 11 bins. I'm going to add these two guys in with an interaction. And I'm going to select MANOVA. And it gives us, you, you can ignore the statistics, but it allows us to see what the overall mean is doing. Here's the interval schedule. So this is just what we saw in the bubble plot. And here is, here is the schedule. Okay. And if you wanted to do more formal statistics, again, it's just an unfolding of asking for the options. So I think we've already talked about this. So, um, so I appreciate you coming today. Um, I've been a Jump fan and user since probably the 90s. Um, and what I like about it is that I taught very low level statistics. And the software helps to take some of the mystery out of statistics. I can click on a bar. I can see what that bar is composed of. I can see how the observations relate to other variables. So, so it makes it so the statistics aren't very scary. And p-values come to you naturally as you run the statistics. Um, and again, there are a lot of packages out there that are very nice. They simplify um, data analysis. Um, they, they eliminate the need for a lot of hand computation. I, I'm not an Excel person, so I was trying to look at your formulas, and I'm thinking, what the heck are you doing? Um, and I imagine that unless you're really knowledgeable in the field, other people might look at it and say, what the heck is he doing? Um, so it, it eliminates the need to do a lot of that sort of work. The user-friendly interface, the point and click, drag and drop, um, the, the, the ability to, to run an analysis but not have to tell Jump, I want this particular test to run, um, makes it so that you can get to the statistics much more quickly. And it also makes it so that um, you can communicate much more effectively. Okay. Um, so that's all I have. Um, I've already done this. Apparently, I moved my slides around. So I want to thank you for coming. And Bill? Okay. It's, it's hard for me to imagine what they exactly are. So what I'm trying to do is elicit, uh, I have a problem or I have a, a fantasy that I want to do this and this and this and this. Right. And then I want to hear you respond to how to do that. Okay. But I don't know if I can elicit that. Who's talking? Uh -huh. Seems like it's just right here. I mean, I'm very impressed by what you but I mean, a very elementary question. You haven't told us how you export your final graph or table. Okay. That's a fairly sure. Step sure. Most of so let me um, let me go back to something I've run, um, and I'll just do a distribution. So you can you can import data in from a variety of sources. Any graph. Um, like this. You can, by the way, I didn't show you this, you can rescale dynamically, you can resize, you can change colors, you can change the title. And I tend to do all that first, so if I click here I can change it. If I click on any axis I can change the axis. Once I get the look and feel the way I like it, across the top uh, you have some toolbars or some tools. And this selection tool here allows you to grab whatever portion of the output you're interested in, hit Control C, and then go to PowerPoint or wherever and paste special, and then paste it as an enhanced metafile. This guy right here. 
and it'll paste it as an object exactly as you see it. Yeah, you, all, you can also save it as, so if you didn't want to do that, sorry, you can go to edit, save selection as, and you can save it as encapsulated postscript so you can edit it in Adobe Illustrator or some other package. Okay. Yes. Could you create those stacked graphs in Jump? Yes. Would you have to export them? Yes. You could do that. Yes. You yeah. can build up yes. a complex visual display. Yes. In fact, um, some of the graphs I didn't talk about, um, one of the nicest ones for doing that, I believe, is overlay plot, where it allows you to split out. Um, and there's also plots like, um, for example, if I want to do a scatter plot. Let me get to, to, to a different data set. Um, this, this is just some car data. Um, if I want to um, create a scatter plot, for example, I know you do, I've seen a lot of scatter plots. Um, if I select a lot of variables and I want to say I want to group it by, say, uh, country or make, then I get this sort of thing. But I can also get it so I just get one axis on the bottom depending on what I've selected. So, so there's different platforms where you can do that. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? And yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yes. You just have to tell when you're in PowerPoint, you have to tell it what it is that you're pulling in. You have to set it to flash and it knows to, to recognize it. Yeah, and we actually have some steps on our website for embedding into PowerPoint. Roslyn? Hans Roslyn? Right. So we run an animal right. some session, generate a whole bunch of variables, and then add that to an array. Right, right. So to watch the system determine the baseline gets stable so we can use the uh, sure. variables. Sure. So it's nice to be able to do that automatically. Mm -hmm. Computer generates the data, we import it into a, a file and, and plot it automatically. Run them back and you see the line going and, and, and you, yeah, you chuck it on a Right. You can do that. Yep. Well you can um, you can either set up Jump to go out and get the data, or you can tell Jump, import this data in and just add it to the bottom. Um, and you can run a script, and you can also schedule them. I think, Rusty, you're doing some work with scripting right now, aren't you? Very minor, but it's yep. you um, can loop through scripts. You can have a script that calls scripts. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the scripting language is, is quite uh, um, evolved. Um, it's called JSL, Jump Scripting Language. Um, and there's a, there's a library. Um, and there's, there's classes available, but under our help menu, um, all, all of the help files, um, so, so uh, these are searchable PDFs, very rich, uh, and then a listing of the JSL functions. Um, so e for each one of these, it gives examples of what the text would look like, and you can copy and paste. Um, and the way I learned scripting is by saving output. So if I, if I, if I run something and I want to be able to regenerate it, if I click on this top red triangle in any window, and by the way, here's Flash as well, so if you're doing histograms and you want people to do the same thing where you're clicking on bars, you can save that as Flash as well. Uh, but I can save the code, and now you see this appeared here. So this allows me to rerun this at any time, but it's also a nice way to learn um, the scripting language. So I can just copy and paste this and piece it together. Any other thoughts or questions? I did want to offer, uh, offer one more thing on the Excel integration. Um, you might have a lot of formulas um, in Excel. And if you have complex models built in Excel and you want to be able to visualize those models using a profiler, um, you can push the, the models over to jump. In the profiler that I showed you that allowed you to drag around values of the x's, you can do the same thing off of the models, and the models reside in Excel. Um, so you may have something that's really, rather complicated and you don't want to have to regenerate it and jump and it'll, it'll, it'll work off of that. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Is it built, is it built on SAS? 
No, it's, it's standalone. It's, it's standalone, um, but uh, it has an integration to SAS. So if you're doing work, and Jump has um, probably 95% of what most people do, and, it, and it's also customizable, but there's some code that we don't have. Like we don't have structural equation models, but SAS does. So you can interface with SAS if you want to, but it, it's standalone, so you don't have to have SAS. No. And it's a rather small uh, install. It's not, not very big. Any other questions? Well, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.